All right, let's get started. So we've got Adit Madan from Alexio. Uh, Adit is a software engineer there and has been working on uh, the Alexio integration for DCOS. And Mesosphere and Alexio work together on this partnership to make this happen. That's what Adit is going to talk about and then demo the integration as well. Thanks, Robbie, for the introduction. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about how Alexio can be used to accelerate Spark workloads on a Mesos cluster. I'll start with a brief overview of Alexio for those who are not familiar with it. I'll move to two use cases of this solution being used in production. And then I'll talk about the architecture of the solution with some details followed by the deployment of Alexio on DCOS and a demo with performance numbers. To begin with the overview, if we look at the big data ecosystem of yesterday, there was only one compute framework, which was Hadoop MapReduce, and it had only one storage system, which was the Hadoop distributed file system. The problem with this was that Compute and storage was always co-located, and if you had to schedule, if you had to scale out the storage, you would also scale out the compute resources, and vice versa. However, if you look at the ecosystem today, there are a lot more compute frameworks for both streaming and batch workloads, and there are an equal number or even more st storage systems, each with its own pros and cons. And in most cases, these compute frameworks and storage systems are not co-located. The part about being not co-located gives you the flexibility of expanding storage and compute independently. The issue is that each application manages connections to the storage systems individually, and optimizing for storage access requires application level changes and there is no sharing between different applications. So if an app, two applications were, were sharing the same data, they would cache it individually, duplicating the data in memory and, and, make, uh, and making sure that, and, and there would be no, uh, there would be duplication of data. This is where Alexio comes in. Alexio provides a storage abstraction for all of the different storage systems that you have, be it on-premise or in the cloud, across different file systems as well as object storage systems, and you can access the data using, typically using a file system API. And this can be done without any code changes at the application level, and you can continue to use your Spark applications, Presto, Flink application, name it, and uh, without any application changes. The highest performance is guaranteed by storing all the, managing all of the data in memory and providing shared access across the different applications that you have. To summarize, uh, App Alexia has been used for a variety of applications ranging from big data to deep learning, as I'll talk about in the next few slides. I would, uh, to summarize, uh, Alexio unifies all of the data in your cluster. It provides high performance by in-memory data management. It provides cost saving, and you have no vendor lock-in as, from an end user perspective, migrating data across storage systems is transparent. I would also like to mention that Alexio is one of the fastest growing big data open source projects. The graph that we're looking at is the number of contributors for different popular frameworks in their early months. Uh, the left, uh, the y-axis is the number of contributors and as you can see, Alexio is doing pretty well. Moving on to use cases of the given solution in production by uh, existing today. 
Now, the first one I'm going to talk about is Chunar. Chunar is China's biggest travel search portal. They were using Spark and, and Flink in combination to tackle an incoming stream of click data from their website. The storage systems that they used were HDFS and Ceph. They used Alexio as a storage abstraction layer and also as a mechanism to share data from a pipeline of data processing flowing between Spark and Flink. On average, this, for their workloads, they saw about 15x performance improvements. And on a peak workload, they see up to 300x performance improvements. The link that I have on screen gives you more information about the solution. The second use case that um, I would like to talk about is Gardent Health. Gardent Health is a genomics data processing, uh, does uh, some data analysis on genomics data for cancer patients. They used Spark to process data across different storage systems that they have, both on-premise and in the cloud. and they scaled up to exabytes of data. They moved to a solution using Alexio and Mesos and an object store called Minio. Minio gave them, a, Minio was used for cold data with backups to Amazon S3. They also saw orders of magnitude of performance gains when they used Alexio in combination with Mesos. The, link that I have on the screen has more information. In the words of our friends at Garden Health, uh, the benefits that they saw from Alexio with performance could literally be a lifesaver for their patients. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the architecture of the solution and some of the details. Now, let's say we have two Spark applications running on a Mesos cluster. Both Spark applications would have their own context with their own caching of any data that they access. In this picture, we have these two applications accessing data from HDFS and Amazon S3, or it could be any other storage system that so whenever an application accesses the data, they would maintain its own copy. So in this diagram, we see that the two applications uh, have their own copy of blocks one and three, and there, there is no sharing of the data between these two applications. The other thing that we see in this picture is that the lifetime of the cache data is tied to the lifetime of the application itself. Now, if you look at the same picture with Alexio, both applications can talk to Alexio without any code changes. Any data accessed from slow remote storage, such as HDFS and Amazon S3, would be cached in Alexio. Typically, Alexio is close to the compute cluster, which is the Spark cluster in this case, and the HDFS or storage system could be, could be remote, it could be co-located. Alexio gives you the flexibility of maintaining performance even, even regardless of the location of the, the storage that you're accessing. So in this case, if the same two applications access blocks one and three, you, you'll see that there's only one copy of these data in, in Alexio. This means that the memory, which is expensive in your compute cluster, is being well utilized. There's no duplication of data, and this will in turn lead to performance gains when the memory is overutilized. Like I mentioned before, uh, if the storage and the compute 
in case of vanilla spark are tightly associated. So in case there is, and they lie in the same JVM. So let's look at what, hap what would happen when the application goes away, and particularly when the Spark context that is running the application is no longer accessible, which could be when you have a crash or you just decide to close it. Now, once the application goes away, the storage that is associated with that application is also inaccessible which means that when the same blocks are accessed again, they will have to be fetched from the remote storage cluster that you have. And this access is typically bound by network or slow disk IO. The same picture, Spark accesses data from Alexio. In this case, if you have a crash, the, the data is still accessible in Alexio. And Alexio would manage this data in memory or across different tiers of storage on the compute cluster. Which means that once the same data is accessed by the application that died or some other application, you still have that data in memory. To summarize, the lifetime of the data is disassociated from the lifetime of the end application which is using it. This provides both, this provides performance when the data is being shared across different lab applications and also during uh, scenarios in which we have uh, failures. Now, Alexio has been integrated with DCOS. Alexio is available as one of the packages in the DCOS uh, universe. You could use Alexio, you could use DCOS to deploy and manage Alexio in a DCOS cluster. Now, on a DCOS cluster, Alexio brings a unified view of all of the data that you have, be it on a DCOS cluster or from outside. It brings high performance and predictable SLA for your workloads. DCOS makes provisioning of Alexio easy. It, it manages elasticity, both scaling up and scaling out. And together, the solution enables faster analytics with Spark and other, workload, other frameworks which are running on the DCOS cluster. It also enables you to access data from disparate, uh, disparate storage systems, both, uh, for example, HDFS and S3. And in the demo that I'm going to show you next, we'll see HDFS being mounted as the root, uh, root under storage system in Alexio. What I mean by an under storage system is just one of the storage systems that is backing Alexio. And you'll, you'll be able to access Amazon S3 in the same namespace, which is a file system like namespace. The demo is based on an Amazon EC2 cluster. We'll have Spark and Alexio running on Mesos on, a D on DCOS. We will access data from Amazon S3 by running a simple Spark count application, and we'll see some of the performance numbers of uh, the given solution. The versions used in the demo, uh, we, have, we'll, we have used the last release of Alexio, Alexio 1.5. We used the previous release of DCOS 1.94 and with Spark 2, uh, 2.02 running on Amazon M3. Extra large instances.
Uh, for the demo, we have a pre-deployed DCOS cluster. It will access data from HDFS. We see that in HDFS, we have a single file called license.txt, which will appear in the Alexio namespace once we mount this HDFS location into Alexio. We will also access data from an S3 cluster. In S3, we have two files, readme and a sample one gigabyte file. The one gigabyte file is what will be used for the performance numbers. For Alexio on DCOS, we have a Docker registry set up. The Docker registry will be used to hold the Alexio client Docker image, which is built as part of the deployment process. And the client Docker image has the Alexio CLI in it, which will be used to access the Alexio file system. In addition, uh, during the deployment process, we build a Docker image for running Spark on top of Alexio. The Docker image will have the Spark shell and is also the Docker image used for Spark executors. To install Alexio on DCOS, locate the package in the universe. The first thing that you need to do is obtain a license from Alexia and Base64 encode the license. Don't try to use this license. This license no longer works. So uh, the next thing that we do is uh, have HDFS as the root un under storage for Alexio. Like I mentioned before, any writes that you do to Alexio or any reads that you do from HDFS will be available at the root of the Alexio file system namespace. Now, uh, we just specified the under storage system for Alexia and the license, and that's all that is needed to deploy Alexia with the default configuration. Now, you can monitor the progress of the installation in the services tab in DCOS. Uh, after waiting for a few minutes, uh, you'll see that all of the processes for Alexio come up, which includes the Alexio master process and Alexio workers for the Alexio distributed file system, as well as other auxiliary processes. Once the installation finishes, you'll have access to the Alexio client image that I mentioned before. So we just logged into the master node in DCOS to access the CLI. And once we're in the master node, we can pull the, uh, the client image that I mentioned earlier. Now the client image that was built as part of the deployment has all of the configuration that is required to connect a client to Alexio set up already. So once you have access to the image, you can run the Alexio CLI, which is little hidden on top. It says bin Alexio FSLS. So the file that we see over here, license.txt, is being fetched from HDFS, which we configured as the storage system backing Alexio. The not in memory annotation over there specifies that only the metadata from HDFS has been fetched into Alexio. The data itself will be fetched into Alexio once we access, access the, the file.
So the next thing that we do is we mount an S3 bucket into Alexia. We specify the credentials that are required to access the S3 bucket. In this case, we mount S3 at the location slash S3A into the Alexia file system. And DCOS demo is the name of the bucket in S3. So you'll be able to access both S3 and HDFS in a unified namespace, and you can easily migrate your data between uh, the two, two storage systems. The end application only talks to Alexio, and it is, in, uh, it is unaware of where the data is being accessed from. So you just specify an Alexio path, and that's all that is needed for your application to talk to one or more under storage systems. So as you can uh, see, uh, S3 was mounted at that location. And once we list the contents at the location S3A in Alexia, we'll see the same two files that we had in our Amazon bucket, readme and sample one gigabyte. Sample one gigabyte, like I mentioned before, is the file that we'll use for the performance numbers in the count spark job that I'll run. Like I mentioned before, the not in memory annotation only means that the metadata has been fetched from the storage systems back in Galaxia and not the data yet. So in the terminal that I have open below, I'll run a Spark application, which is a count job. I log into the Spark, into the DCOS master node, and pull the Spark Docker image that was built as part of the deployment. Now, now that we have the, we have pulled the Docker image, we'll start a Spark shell, running the Spark job on Mesos on the DCOS cluster. Once all of the executors for the Spark job have come up, we'll, the first thing we'll do is set the log level in Spark to info to monitor the timing information. As you can see, the Spark application talking to Alexio, you specify the scheme Alexio followed by the master node of Alexio, and then you specify the path of the file that you want to access. Like I mentioned before, the sample 1G file is not in Alexio memory yet, but when we run the Spark application and the data is being accessed from Alexio, that's the time when you pull the data from S3 into Alexio and all repeated accesses of that data will benefit from the acceleration that is provided by managing data in memory. So we run the count job, uh, which counts the number of lines in the one gigabyte file. We notice that the locality level was process local for this job. What this means is that Alexio does not have the information in memory and there is no locality from Spark, Spark's point of view. As you can see, this job took uh, about 31 seconds to finish and this is when the data was actually pulled into Alexio. Now, if you exit the Spark shell and repeat the same job, let's see what happens. Uh, in the top shell, I just showed you that the annotation for the one gigabyte file, it, ch it changed from not in memory to in memory, which means that now Alexio has the blocks for this file. And in this case, since the default block size 
was 500 megabytes, we have two blocks for the file in Alexio. So we restart the Spark shell and redo the same count job. Set the log level to info again. Reevaluate the file. And issue the count. So this time we can see that the, the locality level was node local which means that the executors, the tasks, had complete locality, and that's why we saw the performance improve from 31 seconds to 3.6 seconds. So the results for the performance experiment that we saw in the demo, uh, the lighter blue bar is the initial count that we did, and the darker blue bar is when you exited the Spark shell and re redid the same experiment again. So if in, in case of Voluxio, you notice that we got an 8x improvement for repeated accesses, independent of the Spark shell, Spark context that you're using for the data access. However, if you access the data directly from S3, the initial count and any repeated counts after the Spark context has been re restarted, they have the same performance. So the gist of this is that when you have repeated uh, accesses or when you have data being shared across different applications, you will see tremendous performance gains from Alexio. To conclude, uh, Alexio is easy to use in a Mesos environment. DCOS brings you ease of deployment and ma management of the application. With Alexio, you get predictable performance with a controlled caching system, and you get improved performance as well. Alexio is, Alexio easily connects to the different storage systems that you may have be it HDFS, S3, Ceph, you name it, there are a number of connections that you can do from Alexio to the storage system. So go, go use Alexio, it's awesome. So the, that's it from my side. Thank you for listening to the talk. Uh, you can reach me at adit.alexio.com for any uh, further questions that you may have after after the conference, and I'll be happy to take any questions now. So the question was that how long is the caching available? So you have, do have control over how long the data stays in Alexio. So by default, there will be no eviction until the memory is full. So, uh, so the question was, how do you handle write workloads? For writes, we have different policies for writes. So the default policy, uh, we have a policy called cache through, which means that writes will be cached in Luxio memory as well as propagated to the storage system, which is backing the path. You can have, multi you can have different options, such as something, a feature called fast durable writes, which means that we will Make sure that the writes go into Alexio. We replicate the data in Alexio, and we asynchronously propagate the update down to the storage systems, which means that when you do a write to Alexio, you're guaranteed that your data will not be lost, and we will eventually persist the data to the backing storage system. Did that answer your question? Mm-hmm. Uh, 
I believe we only, uh, so uh, unfortunately I'm not in a good position to answer that question since I'm not sure I completely understand it. Uh, but I, we can talk uh, uh, afterwards to make uh, for a longer conversation. Any more questions? All right, we're good. Thanks. Thank you.